I will now call to order the Monday, November 14, 2011, informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. Welcome to all of you here at Carnegie Town Hall and those that are following the meeting on uh, SiouxFalls.org. We'll start out with a staff report by Interim City Clerk Sue Roust. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Council. Sue Roust, Interim City Clerk. Uh, three things I want to just um, cover today. First of all, just so you know, there are, will be two walk-in items on the agenda tonight. Uh, so there are some notes in your annotated version of the agenda uh, about those items. The election last Tuesday, um, we have a few things to show you. Uh, thanks primarily to David Bixler, your budget analyst. He just loves to do charts and, and comes up with some really interesting stuff. And so he created a, a short PowerPoint for us to go over some of the results. Uh, just a note, we did um, go down to the county today. They had two provisional ballots to count. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's an important part of the election process. On election day, those people who believe they should have a right to vote but that the auditors cannot find registered are allowed to vote what's called a provisional ballot that's sealed in a special envelope. And then after the election, there's research done. Of those, I think there were 13 total. There were two that were eligible to count, and so those were counted today. Uh, in fact, they split 50-50. So as you look at the election results on the resolution tonight, they will be almost identical to what you saw last Tuesday night. One more yes vote and one more no vote. So the, uh, let's look at these slides. Is it, uh, what'd they do? Try again. Aha, here we go. Uh, one thing that was notable all through this process was absentee voting, which we reported to you on a regular basis that was way out of line with any previous city election. This chart shows the 2010 city election and runoff election, uh, which were previous records for number of voters. And um, as you can see, the number of absentees was, was way beyond anything that the city has ever experienced before. So then we started watching um, comparing it to primary elections. And in fact, we had more votes than just about any primary. Well, we did have more votes than any primary election ever. Um, the one that was closest was 2004, which also was a special election for US representatives. So, so it really was astounding. As these numbers were coming in, we were trying to figure out, is it really that the turnout is going to be so great, uh, or is it that people just love absentee voting now? As it turns out, it was an indicative of turnout. The final turnout was over 40,000 voters. The city has never had more than 32,000 for a city election. So to me, that's the really outstanding thing, the number of people that were engaged in this election. David did just a couple of things kind of for his own interest, and he, he thought they were interesting to share with you. This is comparing to last year the uh, increase in turnout in each precinct. So last year, if a precinct had 40% turnout, and this year they had 50%, that would be show up here as a 10% uh, bar. And you can see that they range anywhere. Every one of them is positive. Uh, 57 and 57 precincts, the turnout increased over last year. 41 of 57 voted yes. So not only did we have a, a significant yes versus no vote, but across the city we had uh, a fairly broad support. It wasn't in a, you know, it wasn't split 50-50 between precincts. It was 72% uh, of the precincts voted yes. And then the last slide shows the change in registered voters per precinct. Uh, because we had a, a general election in there, you would tend to expect that numbers of voters, registered voters had gone up, but some of them are kind of startling. Uh, the very highest one, Precinct 111 and 12 in southwest Sioux Falls in Lincoln County, went up by 400 voters. And that's also one of the ones that increased in uh, turnout percentage, too. Uh, some of the others, um, one, four, and five, uh, the area around the mall, and uh, 317, 
out west 314, 39, and 10, those are all western edge of Sioux Falls. So, so it's clear that our population is growing to the west and south, as you well know because of what you've seen in the census numbers. I would say even though the numbers are not in finally, we will probably end up with, even though this is a fairly costly election, it will be the lowest cost per voter that we have seen in at least a long, long time. So, so I'm, I'm pleased with the way the election um, ran. We didn't have any major snags. We were fortunate to have good weather. And um, so wanted to just share some of that with you. The uh, last thing I wanted to mention was um, you're establishing your legislative priorities for 2012. I met with council leadership this last week and, and we um, talked a little bit about your process. Last year, you passed a resolution in December, about mid-December, uh, agreeing to what your legislative priorities were as a council. That had been discussed at a working session in mid-November. and. Uh, you do have a working session scheduled this week, but I believe it's going to be a very uh, full agenda. And then your next one, we don't know when that will be scheduled. That will be one of the things you'll de be determining Wednesday. And as a side note, please bring your calendars so you can get that, that scheduled. Uh, but do you want to have me send out information to you by email or would you like to discuss this at le next week's informational session or how would you like to handle your legislative priorities? I can go based on what you did last year, um, but I don't know if that's how you would like to handle it. So I, I would appreciate your guidance. Any direction from the council? <laughs> I guess that I would like to see, um, to be reminded of what our priorities were last year. So if that could be sent to us, and then I would, um, if it's all right with the council, we'll have a, dis during council open discussion, we could discuss um, l having taken a look at that list, um, what we wanted to keep on, what we wanted to take off, and then possibility of any other suggestions that council members may have. And I think, Sue, that you have, you were going to bring forward something to us. One item related to elections, yes. Does that meet with everyone's agreement? All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Councilor Karski. Yes, I guess I have one. Um, regarding the absentee ballots, are, are those people counted as part of their precinct, or do we know what, how the absentee vote went overall? They were counted as part of the precincts. That's usually the fastest way to do it, uh, if we can just run them through. And, and since absentees are folded, if we can put them in with, with a precinct and kind of help flatten them out. So no, we do not know how the absentee voters voted versus the precinct voters. They're all, all together. Councilor Rolfing. Uh, Sue. I know we, uh, we kind of stuck you in a difficult position, um, and we want to, uh, I want to publicly thank you right oh. now and your staff, um, the staff, the clerks, and, and Dave Bixler for just a tremendous, just tremendous job that you did in running this election. We couldn't have done it without you, and, uh, and to pull it off the way you did uh, was just not miraculous, but it was, uh, it was uh, next to it. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, thank you very much. The groundwork was laid when I got here. Um, the staff has been working extremely hard, as you know, over the last few weeks, and I'm just pleased with how well it went. Thank you. Any other questions for Sue? Thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. If not, we'll go on to City Council open discussion. And Councilor Brown, could you give us a recap of last Monday's fiscal committee meeting? Sure, we had a short meeting, very short. Uh, we just talked, first of all, about the Sioux Empire Fair. No new updates there, really. They are still working between the city and the county to uh, get us some figures and a better understanding of how we would move forward if we would move forward on any help with the uh, county fairgrounds. And the other issue we just had was uh, early stages of a fraud policy, which Oak Soul is going to be working with internal audit to develop that, and then we'll also run it through the fiscal committee. Any questions for Councilor Brown? If not, thank you. 
Councillor Anderson, Jr., would you give us a preview of today's public services meeting? Today we'll be looking at the uh, zoo agreement update. Uh, we'll get an update by uh, Assistant Director of Parks, Dave Fisher, uh, working with the city attorney and city finance departments and give us an update on how that agreement is going at this time. We'll also be looking at an amendment to Ordinance 14-85, increasing the time between the annual city election and the runoff election uh, from two to three weeks. Any questions for Councillor Anderson, Jr.? Thank you. Um, any other city council open discussion? Councillor Karski. Turn that on. Um, Saturday night, Councillor Aguilar and I were attended the um, get this right the American Council of Engineering Companies for their annual South Dakota Awards Banquet. And being the modest group that most engineers are, that they really don't like to publicly be recognized for the, some of the accomplishments over the years. But um, several Sioux Falls engineering firms, HDR, Sayer and Associates, Howard R. Green. Um, we recognized as well as our engineers from the city for projects such as um, the response to the um, emergency sewer lines, <clears throat> our roundabouts that we built, um, the water purification plant um, in the backwash basin. You know, not all glorious projects, but boy, they sure make a difference in our quality of life and the work that they've done. So just want to congratulate our engineering department and the local engineering firms on their accomplishments and the, the awards they received Saturday night. Thank you. Uh, ditto to that. It was a very nice event. And one thing I also learned is that uh, department uh, manager Greg Anderson could be a great stand-up comic because his comments were, were very uh, humorous at points. So it was a great event. Um, any other council open discussion items? Again, a reminder, our work session from 4 to 6 on Wednesday night. And please bring your calendars because we do need to schedule um, the next um, work session. We'll now go into our presentations, and we'll start with an update of the November 19th Neighborhood Summit event. And I think we'll hear from Erica Beck. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. I'm going to leave most of the presentation up to uh, the Economic Development Coordinator in our uh, Division of Economic Development and Community Development, Adam Roach. He is relatively new to our office, so please welcome him, and he's going to talk with you about the Neighborhood Summit on Saturday. Thanks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, respective counselors, Mr. Fifley, Ms. Rouse, Ms. Palmer. Uh, my name is Adam Roach again with the Economic Development Division of the Community Development Department. On behalf of Russ Sorensen and the Planning Department, uh, thank you for the opportunity to give an update on the Mayor's Neighborhood Summit. Um, the summit date is November 19th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Euphorium Theater, the Enns Amel Studio located on North Phillips Avenue. Uh, the cost is free and includes continental breakfast and lunch, and these costs are covered by the Pettigrew Heights Housing Resource Center, which was uh, a grant received uh, from the City Foundation in 2009. Uh, registered, uh, registration is uh, required pre-registration at www.siouxfalls.org or by calling 367-8179. I guess a little background information on what inspired the first annual Mayor's Neighborhood Summit. Um, through feedback from a multitude of neighborhood stakeholders, residents are looking for opportunities to strengthen community ties. This feedback inspired the first annual Mayor's Neighborhood Summit. Our goal for the, summer, the summit is to provide an opportunity for neighbors to engage each other, share neighborhood success stories, reach out to residents with nonprofit and city resources, and provide an opportunity for residents to share their thoughts and vision for future neighborhood planning. Uh, we have 91 registered guests so far, uh, seven nonprofits that will be involved, uh, consisting of uh, resource tables. Uh, we'll also have nine city department resource tables um, that includes uh, fire, health, park and rec, and a multitude of other departments. Um, and also the Porch Talk Neighborhood Listening and Learning Session with Mayor Huther uh, to kick things off. Uh, there will be five, or, or I'm sorry, six roundtable discussions uh, that include neighborhood association organization, uh, neighborhood beautification, neighborhood safety and watch, uh, community problems, community problem solving, 
and um, urban agriculture. Uh, please get the word out to your constituents, and we hope to see you all there. Um, are there any questions at this time? Any questions for Adam? If not, thank you, Adam. Thank you. We'll now go on to Event Center Bond Financing, which we'll hear from Director Turback. Good afternoon, Tracy Turback with the Finance Department. We had an exciting week last week, didn't we? The uh, great report on the uh, election turnout results, and uh, of course, this is a follow-up to the the subject that uh, that was our special election. Um, we've brought in the uh, some of the experts that we've been working with uh, over the past six or eight months or so on the. Uh, financing plan for the event center project and I want to provide a, a we're going to provide an overview uh, of the financing plan and specifically um, talk about some of the actions that the council will will be asked to take here uh, over the next couple of weeks <clears throat> with me today and, and sharing in the presentation will be our, our two uh, co-bond councils Doug Hayek with Davenport Evans and Bruce Bonjour with Perkins Coy out of out of Chicago uh, they will both be speaking to you, as well as uh, Myron Knutson, who is with uh, uh, PFM, which is our financial advisory firm, and, and Myron will talk a little bit about the, uh, the bond sale and the bond sale process. The, uh, in addition to that, I've got two uh, resolution items that the Council uh, will be addressing tonight on your agenda uh, that are related to the Event Center project itself, and I will uh, explain more about those in just a minute. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Doug Hayek and Bruce Bonjour, and they can uh, cover the issues on the, the, specifically the bond ordinance that will be before you tonight for first reading. Madam Chair and members of the council, my name is Doug Hayek with Davenport Evans. I've been in front of you lots of times before, uh, and, and I'm pleased to have with me today uh, Bruce Bonjour, who's acting as co-bond counsel in this transaction. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start out and talk about the bond ordinance, uh, at least parts of it, and uh, Bruce will uh, also be dealing with other parts. But as you'll note, which is fairly typical, uh, and all of these, uh, whenever we do, whenever we do bond issues, the first three pages or so is kind of a recitation of the history of our bond issuances, uh, starting back in 1988 when the current indenture of trust was entered into, and then all of the uh, subsequent supplemental uh, indentures that have been uh, entered into to issue other bonds. Uh, subsequently. So I think we're past the 16th one by now. And uh, this ordinance authorizes the issuance of sales tax revenue bonds in the amount of $115 million plus the cost of issuance and uh, an amount that will be placed into a debt service reserve and potentially capitalized interest. But um, so the actual dollar amount of the bond issue will be uh, in excess, of, uh, well, we don't know for sure exactly, but it most likely will be in excess of $115 million. But the, um, but, but the amount of the issue will be sized so that it generates $115 million to cover the cost of the project. And there'll be more discussion about that later, but I just wanted to touch on that point quickly uh, at the beginning. The um, next uh, item, I guess, to just to highlight is that the bonds, like like all these others uh, that I've mentioned, are secured by 
a, a lien or a pledge of the second penny sales tax. And uh, all of these bond issues that are outstanding currently, as well as this one, will have what's called a parity pledge. Everybody's really on equal footing. Everybody has the same, uh, the same pledge, regardless of when the bonds were issued. So everybody is treated the same. Um, the ordinance also sets the broad parameters, not broad, I guess, uh, the parameters of the bond issue. It's within some fairly narrow constraints. But there is some, uh, a little bit of flexibility because we do have a bond sale coming up and we're going to have a competitive sale and we want to be able to uh, structure this in the way that's most advantageous to the city. So you'll notice in section 2B of the ordinance uh, there is a um, reference to the dollar amount. The uh, final, maturity, uh, final maturity date on these bonds would be potentially as late as 2037. Uh, the interest rate would be not greater than 4.75% on tax exempt bonds that are issued or 6.5% on bonds that are issued on a taxable basis. And I'm just going to mention very briefly, there is the possibility of a small amount of, uh, of taxable bonds Mr. Bonjour is going to uh, speak a little bit more to that question as to why, uh, why there may be some taxable bonds issued. But it's, uh, it's, it's only to give the city some flexibility and if it, um, if it is advantageous to the city uh, in the way it operates the event center. And uh, it also provides on the terms the, that, that the debt service would be substantially level. We're not talking about uh, putting off a large principal payment to the end. Uh, essentially, it's level debt service, uh, except in the early years, uh, in the first couple of years, there'll be some adjustment for uh, other bonds payments that are uh, coming due, and, uh, but otherwise it would be a substantially level debt service period. And then also, uh, one of the other terms is that the bonds will be sold at not less than the par amount. So that means if you have a million dollars uh, face amount of the bonds, you will be selling them for not less than a million dollars. That is, that's all that that means. Um, I'm going to move this to the next thing here. The ordinance also provides for the approving the official notice of sale. And that's all in connection with this competitive process for getting the best pricing for the city. And uh, Mr. Bonjour is going to talk about uh, uh, one of the things that he has been spending a tremendous amount of time on, and that's to uh, convert uh, our existing indenture and all of the supplements that we've had over the years into an amended and restated indenture. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Bruce at this time. Oh, excuse me. Before I do, <laughs> I want you to know that I've worked with Bruce Bonjour for pretty much the last 25 years on a lot of projects in South Dakota. Uh, he is, uh, he's, he's, he's got a, a great interest in South Dakota. He's he uh, has ongoing relationships with the South Dakota Building Authority and uh, with, the, um, uh, with, the, with the South Dakota Conservancy District, which uh, issues the bonds that fund the SRF program. He was the bond council when South Dakota did its uh, tobacco bond issue a few years back. Uh, and one of, the, one of the great things, in addition to his connections to South Dakota and uh, uh, long-term practice in this state is uh, the kind of other background that he brings to the table uh, with his experience uh, on other sports facilities along with his uh, colleague in Chicago, Mark Oberdorf. Um, Bruce served as bond counsel on Soldier Field, uh, the um, refinancing of Comiskey Park, the um, several billion dollars worth of bonds for McCormick Place in Chicago, and I know that uh, Mark has been involved in many uh, other bond issues as well. His expertise is particularly in the area of, of, uh, of taxation for tax-exempt bonds. Uh, he was involved in the Jacobs Field Project in Cleveland 
um, a number of years ago. So uh, that I think is very important in this project. These are, these are unique facilities. They have a lot of unique facts and uh, Bruce will talk about that as well if you have any questions as to what some of those unique arrangements are. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having us. Uh, it's not often your partner gives you all those compliments. Doug and I have worked for over 20 years, and uh, it, it's a pleasure to be back in South Dakota uh, for this transaction. Doug and I are partnering on this. Two different law firms were giving the same legal opinion at the end of the day on your, uh, on your bond, so effectively you're getting uh, uh, two uh, identical legal opinions, one from a Chicago firm and one from a Sioux Falls firm. And Doug and I have worked together uh, enough so that we, uh, I think, have been able to effectively divide the workload in a way where there's not a lot of duplication. Uh, I will not address what the bond ordinance does because Doug's already done that. What I'd like to do is give you a flavor of two other uh, uh, issues that we're dealing with uh, on behalf of the city. Doug mentioned uh, the possibility of issuing some taxable bonds. This sounds sometimes unusual for folks. It's a, it, it's a governmental facility. Why does it have to be partially taxable, partially tax exempt bonds? We've run into this issue before at Soldier Field. We've run into it at Comiskey. We've run into it. In, in other typically event centers or athletic facilities. Effectively, without getting too deep in the weeds here, the federal government gets concerned when tax exempt bond proceeds get used for private purposes. To the extent that you have private use of your facilities, that counts against a certain percentage of overall use and revenues that can be derived from those facilities, and if we exceed the limitations, it causes all of your bonds to become taxable. So one of the benefits that we've tried to bring to this transaction and to, to your professional team is a way to manage that process to protect your tax exemption on your bonds. On the other side of the coin, we don't want the city of Sioux Falls to be in a position whereby because we issued all tax exempt bonds, you have a limitation operationally that precludes you from deriving revenues from private sources who benefit from using your facilities. So what we're doing as we move toward a bond issue date in the not too distant future is evaluating whether or not we need to issue any bonds on a taxable basis in order to provide the city with the, the most flexibility to enter into contracts with private parties so that you can then have uh, contracts in, in, in place which will maximize potential revenue from private sources to subsidize what is otherwise a public facility. Now, I'm probably already deep in the weeds, so I'll stop there, but I know that one or more of you have raised questions as to why some bonds might be taxable. That's a high level description. I'd be happy to entertain questions on that point if, if people have them. The second, uh, second uh, focus of, of uh, my participation in this, excuse me. Did you want, did you want questions now then? On uh, that issue? I'm, I'm at your mercy. <laughs> now or later, I'm not going anywhere. By private then, by private you mean uh, sports? Uh, Correct. Uh, franchise, take, uh, that kind of thing? Take my soldier field example, the Chicago okay. Bears. Chicago Bears, yeah. okay. That's what I wanted to answer. Okay. But please, interrupt me whenever. My second focus, yes. Councilor Karski. I, I guess while we're on the issue of the um, taxable versus the non-taxable bonds, <clears throat> do we get a private letter ruling based on that from the IRS so that we know that we're prepared in advance so we can cover our base? Uh, the answer would be that uh, it is rarely done. Okay. Uh, there are rulings out there. There's a ruling out there for the um, uh, New York Stadia. There's a ruling out there for a Louisville facility. Uh, there are a couple of rulings on management contracts, which effectively are the way one keeps private use down by entering into contracts that frankly are, are, are uh, counterproductive for generating revenues from private sources. So we have 
those rulings available to us and we structure the transaction based on our understanding of those uh, rulings. Okay. You, I've read here, okay, you know, some articles, I guess, where there have been um, communities that have found themselves in the situation where they've had to pay taxes on it. That's kind of why I'm asking that question, yeah. if it is a standard thing or if it's... Um, in, in the bond business, and I, I've done this for 35 years, uh, you, you rely on private rulings in the past to guide your future actions. Okay. Uh, in, in my 35 years as a bond lawyer, I've probably received three. Okay. And second question, if I may, um, kind of a two-part question. Do you have a feel for what percent of the bonds would be taxable versus non-taxable? And obviously, on a taxable bond, you're going to have a, probably a higher interest rate that's going to have to be paid. Can you give us a feel for that? I'm going to let Myron uh, from PFM ad address the financial question, but let, let, let me try and be responsive none, nonetheless. In, in terms of percentages, I'd be astounded if it was above uh, 20 percent. Uh, right now, the numbers we have seen in terms of your consultant reports and the projected revenue stream suggest to us that we might be able to keep total private revenue under 10 percent. And if that's the case, we would need to issue zero taxable bonds. Okay? That the preliminary numbers. We, We'll probably have a good fix on it in, in the next month or so. It, it's going to be something where you are looking into the future. Uh, the, the cost issue is, is a two-part question. One, one is how much more do you pay in interest? Uh, but it's, it's all a cost-benefit uh, analysis. The only reason you would issue taxable bonds is because you perceive that the benefit of having the flexibility to generate private revenues from private users is going to more than pay you back. And, and it, it, it's all a question of, of whether or not you're, in effect, leaving money on the table by not allowing yourself the flexibility to generate private revenues from private beneficiaries. Now, Myron will tell you the, the, the actual you know, calculation piece of interest. But I, I look at the revenue side, the other side of the coin. The, uh, the, the second focus of, of my practice uh, in, 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 uh, on this transaction is your indenture. You have a sales tax indenture that was drafted in 1988. Uh, it's had 16 supplements and amendments. It, it is literally stacked about this high. And one of the things we've, we've decided to do in, 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 in an effort to modernize your indenture and to give you future flexibility in going to market is to completely amend and restate that indenture. Uh, and so part of what this ordinance does is going to approve the, the uh, amendment and restatement of the indenture so that we can literally toss out the 16 supplements because we'll have integrated all of what they've done into, the, into a new indenture. <clears throat> and we're going to uh, modernize the revenue flow uh, within that indenture to, to, uh, to provide the city the flexibility to fund debt service throughout the year instead of in the prior fiscal year, which is your current requirement. Those provisions that we're adding to the indenture are going to be effective for this bond issue and any future bond issue. And we've also provided for a springing consent of your old bondholders. You have a contract with them. We can't just change it on our own. We need their consent. But uh, it is the judgment of PFM that we can get consent of your past bondholders, maybe not all of them, but in some series, to give you future flexibility in, in we can we, we, we are providing other, we are providing for other changes in your indenture so that it will be easier in the future to yet modernize again as the marketplace evolves. So part of the reason why you're not just approving a 17th supplement, you've done 16 so far, is that we're effectively rewriting it to the extent that we can, modernizing it and integrating it so that it's going to be much easier in the future for you and your professionals to go to market when you need to go to market and to tailor your offering uh, to investors in a way that's going to be most efficient. 
So those are the two things that I focused on the most as well as helping uh, Doug on the tax analysis on this transaction. Doug, do you want to pick up on the rest of the ordinance or, or do you want me to? Well, uh, let's see. Thank you, Tracy. We're on, uh, on page five. The, the bond ordinance does a number of, of very customary things. Once, once you have your second reading and we publish it and we get past the referendum period, uh, it will uh, authorize your mayor, your director of finance, and your city clerk and city attorney to, to supervise the rest of the bond sale uh, uh, process means that we're approving a notice of sale. We've approved the form of bonds. A form, they'll be authorized to enter into a bond purchase agreement. <clears throat> they'll be authorized to enter into a continuing disclosure agreement, which keeps investors apprised of, of the city's financial health in the future. Uh, it will authorize the official statement, which is the prospectus by which we sell the bonds. And it authorizes any other ancillary financing documents that were going to be required in order to actually close the transaction. Next steps are Doug. Yes, the next step uh, after today's first reading of the ordinance would be the second reading of the ordinance next week. And uh, Following that, the ordinance, assuming it's adopted, it would be published, and then it'll be, become effective on the 20th day after publication. And so legally, the bonds could be issued any time after that uh, effective date. Um, so that, that effective date is uh, um, about mid-December with the 20 days running after publication. But I, I don't think, uh, although we, oh, it's legally possible to do it at that time, uh, it's probably more likely that the bonds would be issued in January. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, we're here for questions if you have any. Good afternoon, uh, council members. I'm Myron Knudsen, uh, Managing Director with uh, Public Financial Management. And uh, just a brief overview of the uh, bond sale process. Um, what we'll be doing between now and the bond sale is preparing what's called the official statement. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that before. It just basically contains all the information about the city, financial information, and about the bond issue. Um, at the same time, we'll begin working on the bond rating process. Uh, in the past, the city has received one bond rating from Moody's. Because of the issue size that you're looking at here, uh, it may be beneficial to actually get two bond ratings, uh, one from Standard & Poor's as well as one from Moody's. Uh, that's fairly typical in today's market. Uh, larger bond issues, there's a lot more scrutiny, scrutiny and uh, as a result of that, a lot of times bidders like a second opinion, so to speak. Uh, so we may look at getting two bond ratings rather than one. Uh, you may recall that your outstanding bond rating on sales tax revenue bonds is AA2, which is an excellent rating, and we would anticipate that you'll be looking at a rating similar to that for these particular bonds. But that's part of the process we'll be going through here now in the next uh, six weeks or so. Uh, a little bit about the uh, bond sizing. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the important aspect here is that the bonds are going to be sized to net for construction $115 million. The actual amount of the bond issue size will be larger than that, and that's to cover the cost of issuance and the bond discount and primarily what's called the Debt Service Reserve Fund, which, again, you're familiar with from previous bond issues. Um, That'll be uh, roughly $9.5 million or so for the Debt Service Reserve Fund. That Debt Service Reserve Fund, again, is not an additional cost in that that money gets invested 
you use the interest earnings off of that to make your payments on an annual basis, and when you get to the end, uh, that debt service reserve fund can be used to make your final payment. So it's not like it's an additional cost, so to speak. It's just used to help uh, provide additional security for the bond issue to get the rating that you want, and, and uh, that's the reason for the debt service reserve fund. Uh, in terms of uh, marketing the bonds, uh, we'll be, uh, as I mentioned, uh, putting the official statement together and working on the bond rating, contacting potential bidders. Uh, these will be, at least the tax-exempt bonds, will be what are called non-bank qualified. Uh, there may be a small portion of the bonds that are taxable as well, so we'll have to look at that and uh, tie that in with the uh, sale of the tax-exempt bonds as well and, and would be done at the same time. Um, so we will be doing a competitive bond sale. Um, the type of bidders that you can expect on an issue like this are primarily a lot of the larger players in the bond market, which would be a lot of firms, say, out of New York, for example, like... Uh, J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley, or you'll see some regional uh, players involved too, like uh, Wells Fargo or Piper. So those are the kind of bidders we would expect on an issue like this. Uh, the bond sale itself will take place probably in early January, like the week of January 9th, if everything goes according to timeline. And that means the closing of the bonds would be around January 23rd, so that's when the to actually receive the bond proceeds. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Councilor Karski. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions regarding the uh, bond rating and obtaining the second one. What's the general cost of that type of thing? Is, and is that part of the issuance cost of the bond if we do that? And um, I guess to follow up with that, what kind of benefit could we expect as far as, you know, better interest rate by gaining that? Uh, yes, it is part of the uh, uh, cost of the bond issue, so it will be built into the, the bond proceeds. Um, the benefit of getting that second rating is that it will hopefully uh, get more bidders interested in bidding on these bonds. On uh, issues of this size and type, uh, there are some bidders out there that won't bid unless you do have two bond ratings. So th the primary benefit, as I see it, is to expand the potential universe of bidders, and the more bidders you get on the transaction, the better opportunity you have to get a lower rate. Uh, in terms of cost, uh, the bond rating is about $65,000. So okay. it sounds okay. like a big number, but in, in the scheme of the whole project, uh, if you can save even one basis point, which is a hundredth of a percent, it more than offsets that additional rating cost. Counsel Counselor Rolfing. From my uh, Series 7 days, which was a whole long time ago, uh, can you explain uh, the difference between the um, non-bank qualified and bank qualified? Sure. Uh, Anytime you issue more than $10 million in bonds per calendar year, uh, then the bonds become non-bank qualified. And what that means out in the, in the bond universe is that from a bank's perspective, they're not as attractive to buy because they can't write off the interest cost. Uh, so you tend to pay a little higher interest rate for bonds that are non-bank qualified for that reason. Other questions? Any other questions for Mr. Hayek or Mr. Bonjour? Thank you, gentlemen. Director Turbeck? Okay. There are uh, two other items in addition to the bond ordinance that are on your agenda for tonight. Uh, both of the, the other two items are resolutions that the Council will be asked to approve. The first uh, resolution deals with a temporary funding in the amount of $50,000 that uh, would pay for soils testing and administrative costs. Uh, this is, uh, I know uh, Director Cotter talked to you uh, some weeks ago about the need for some uh, work to be done as quickly as possible should the uh, Event Center project pass, and this would pro provide some immediate uh, or more immediate funding than what we would achieve through the bond sale. 
Now this $50,000 would do the soil testing and cover some administrative expenses, but ultimately when the bonds are sold, the city sales tax fund would be reimbursed for that cost. So this 50000 is part of the $115 million that, that we've talked about in terms of the project cost. <coughs> the other uh, resolution uh, is an amendment to the capital, capital plan. Now that the voters have uh, given us the, the green light to move forward with this project, the capital plan uh, does not currently include the construction of the event center, so this resolution would, would amend the plan to include construction of the event center. Uh, it, in the, if you look at the resolution, you'll notice it's in the amount of $114.5 million. If you recall, the, uh, the capital plan that was approved earlier this fall by the council has a half a million dollars in it in 2012. So when we, we add the, the half a million dollars from 2012 to the 114 and a half, that gets us to the $115 million uh, overall project cost. So those items, as I say, will be on your uh, agenda for tonight. And with that, I will, along with the rest of the gentlemen here, we'll stand ready for any other questions you have. Any other questions? If not, thank you, gentlemen. I would now entertain a motion to enter into executive session for a contractual matter and proposed or pending litigation. Second. Second, Varsky. It's been moved and seconded um, that we go into executive session. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We will now go into executive session.